Hey guys, and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer board game review. And today's game up on the tabletop is Era of Atlantis by CJ Games. This is a three to five player game. It takes about 120 minutes to play, it's a bigger one. And it's for ages 14 and up. And in the game Era of Atlantis, you are playing as uh, one of the many secret societies uh, of Atlantean lore. You, that you are going to be playing as one of these societies that goes into the major nations during the Atlantis era and tries to manipulate them into either causing conflict or by cooing them from the inside in a political manner. You'll be utilizing these markers here to take actions on your turn, whether it be to gain basically currency, uh, coup nations, uh, move in conflict, or take nation actions, and uh, trying to basically secure your nations that you control as the highest power at the end of the game. You'll be utilizing cards, objective cards, in your hand, and at the end of the game, based on the ending of the game, you'll score points. And you're also going to be watching the Doom track. This is the track in which Atlantis will eventually sink into the water, or maybe it will ascend, or there's a continuation that happens. One of three cool endings that actually affect gameplay and scoring. Uh, and all the while, you'll be moving around your units on this board here. Your units are these secret agents, and then the military units on the field are actually based on major nations. Uh, it is a game of taking an action, moving this marker, and passing. And players will also take actions, whether it be on their own board or other nations' boards, up until one of the three endings happens. Either Doom, a continuation, or whether it be Ascension. Whoever has the most points at the end of the game is the winner. Let's talk about the setup, a bit about how to play, and of course my review. Okay, so the setup for the game Era of Atlantis. No joke, it's a big game, it's got a big setup, but I think I can explain most of it. However, there is a great in-detailed rules video that also explains setup down below, links in the description. But we'll get started and I'll give you the basics. The first thing you do is you take the main game board out and place it within reach of all players. Then, each player who's playing the game will choose a secret society. And I'm playing four players here, so I chose Lemurian Brotherhood, Purple Dragon Society, and on the other end is the Order of Thoth and the Sisters of Starlight. We'll explain how to set one of these guys up. I have the Lemurian Brotherhood. I'm going to take the two big pawns and place them on the top right-hand side of the board, and the board will be placed next to me, right next to the main game board. Two control markers. These markers will be added to one of the two cities each, uh, and you're going to be controlling at least two nations throughout the game. You're also going to get a number of spies. These spies can be placed anywhere aside from your board, on your board, just avoiding any main areas. Take the small marker pawn, this is the currency tracker, and place it on the number six. It's also circled. Take two objective cards for the regular game or the light game. And then if you're playing the more complex game, you'll take three of these guys, discard one of them and keep two. These are what you're gonna be using to determine the ending of the game. Depending on turn order of the game, one player is gonna get the first player marker and based on who uh, got that marker, we'll also be determining how you get these boards here. These are bonus viria, which is the currency of the game boards, which at the end of the game you'll place on your marker of your board from 22 to 23 and so on to score bonus additional points. Last but not least is you're going to need a combat marker. This is going to symbolize either attack and defense for coup and conflict actions. And if you're using the red side, it's for the attackers. If you're using the blue, it's for defense. And if you want to remain neutral, then you're going to go ahead and move your marker to the gray area here. Everybody's going to get a player reference. This will detail not only the actions in the game, whether it be from your secret society or the major nations, but also the end of game scoring and all the buildings and what they do. Okay, the main, the main game board now we're going to discuss. We'll go from bottom to top, left to right. First is the round tracker at the bottom. Place the round marker on the one. Place the end of game and the wave marker, depending on the number of players, on the far right end of the track. Place the marker that is... Uh, the end of game one on the little white arrow pointed to the uh, left and place the wave marker on the wave space with the number of players. The wave marker and the end of game are going to always move to the left whenever they move and the round tracker is always going to move to the right. And whenever any of these meet up, that's one way in which the game can end. On the very far end, right hand side on the bottom of the game board, you'll notice these little tracks. These uh, are the different major nations and that is their power in the game. Start by placing each one of their markers on the lowest number. Black will be five, green will be four, etc., etc., until all of them have been placed. They look like little dials here. 
Okay, so let's go over here now to the Ascension Tracker. Just place all the Temple of Lights in these specific areas. You'll notice that some are locked and some are not locked. You'll start with five that you can place, but in order to place any more, you're gonna to need to unlock them by either simply gaining control of little areas on the game board by these little markers here, or by trying to, uh, by successfully making the markers move uh, left or right on the round tracker. Whenever you encounter one of these white cubes, that will be placed on the white cubes on the left hand, the right hand side over here, uh, and or left, there's little spots that go with them. And whenever you have two that attach, you'll be able to uh, unlock one of these extra Temple of Lights. So now the main game here, the main game is gonna basically have a number of major nations. And you're gonna set aside all the markers for each of the major nations. There's red, uh, yellow, green, blue, and black. And based on the number of characters on the markers that you're gonna randomly distribute, you're gonna place a number of units of that color in those areas. Uh, being the game based number of players, you will take a cloth bag and you will take these rectangular uh, markers and you'll be selecting them on the game board uh, randomly along with these uh, rectangles with circles on them. And you'll also be placing down wilderness tiles based on the number of players in certain areas to block off that area. It's not a major or a minor nation. It's kind of like a neutral nation. Uh, while it still can be interacted with in the game, it's not going to be considered one of those two things when it comes to conflict or when it comes to cooing. Each different space here additionally is going to have uh, resources on it, whether it be a building that is a purple building or a green building, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There's also the minor nations will come with a special power uh, sometimes that you'll be able to gain access to whenever one of your major nations controls it. And so seeing that the board is gonna be basically placing units on the major nations based on the spaces they are, are requesting you to do so, and then also placing any buildings or resources on the minor nations and covering up the board so that each space has at least one of these icons on it. And then we'll come to the last two aspects of the game. Uh, on the left-hand side over here, you can see that there are uh, building, there are these cards uh, that are actually the major nations and there's five of them. And when playing with a certain number of players, you'll be taking, uh, removing one, two, et cetera, of them. And I think in a four player game, you actually remove one of them. Uh, and how it works is there's going to be a snake draft where you'll be placing down your markers on these locations here. And you can only ever have one control marker on any one of them. You can never place two on the same one. And at a point in the beginning of the game, you'll be removing one of these so that there's only four nations with four players and eight cubes. So you're always gonna have control of two nations in this game. This is also where you'll be placing your marker whenever you would like to do one of that specific major nation's actions. Over here on the right hand side, you're gonna notice the objective cards. Uh, you're gonna notice that the cards are also gonna have three stations that you'll be placing three randomly on these locations here. And when taking them from these locations, it will trigger certain things at the beginning of the game or when you grab them. And last but not least, you will have these uh, cards here. Uh, these cards will be based on the random uh, minor nation actions that you have uh, pulled from the bag. There's a number of them you get based number of players. And when a major nation controls one of these areas, you will actually have this move over to that major nation. Uh, but currently it's attached to a minor nation as an action that will hopefully later be gained by you to be able to be played. Uh, so these are kind of reference cards to remind you that that, act, that nation has that action. And it's also a way where you can place your marker on it when you want to use that action. And that's pretty much it. Take all the buildings and extra tiles that are not currently in play but will be used, as well as all the major nations' control markers and characters, and place them to the side. Last thing but not least, remember that the larger units are actually going to be worth five of the base units in the game. And there you go, there's a setup for Era of Atlantis. Now, let's explain how to play. Era of Atlantis is played in rounds and turns. For a round, each player will take one turn. And a turn consists of you taking your large pawn and placing it on one of your secret society's actions or one of the major nation actions. The final action you can take is if one of your major nations controls a minor nation with an action, that action will be given to that major nation and you can place your pawn on the minor nation's action, but it's gonna be used as the major nation's action. And hopefully that makes sense. Each of the actions will do something different, whether it be political or whether it be military. 
And whenever you take an action, you must first take your pawns from their starting positions onto an action before you can move one that is already on an action. So the first two actions have to be put onto an action space. You can't leave them on your basic marker area. Action number one is called Intrigue. Intrigue is where you will take spies and you will place them on the board. And based on uh, the number of spies you place is going to be the cost of the spies. One for each spy. It doesn't matter what number on the spy, as long as it's one or more, you can simply place them for one Vera. And you'll spend one for each one you place. If the spy is a zero though, you can place that spy for free. So the intrigue action is basically to place onto the board to make political influence happen in the areas you'd like them to is a way in order to gain political power in certain nations to gain control, whether it be a major or minor nation. Then we come to coup, the next action. Coup is basically what you do with intrigue. When you have a number of spies in a given area, you may coup that area. And to do so, you will look at all of your spies' values in that area and you will target the um, an area's flag value. It's their like political value in the area. Uh, additionally, whenever you coup, you're gonna be utilizing this military board here. If you're playing as the aggressor, you're always gonna use the red side, and if it's your turn, obviously. If you're playing as the defender, meaning you have characters there and you do not actually wish for that area to be controlled by somebody else, you can use the defending side. If you're neutral, um, you can simply select neutral. If you're not playing in the specific conflict, you'll be on the neutral side. But it basically works like this. You'll check your spies, you'll check their values, you'll compare versus the area's value as well as any buildings that might provide benefits. And then you'll do your secret Vera bidding with your combat. Everyone will reveal, you'll tally up the totals, and then based on what you're fighting, whether it be a minor nation or a major nation, something will occur. If it's a minor nation, you can choose either one of your major nations to gain control of it by placing a control marker on it. And if it is a major nation that you are fighting, A, it can't be one you already control. B, you'll place one of your controlling markers from one of these nations here onto one of the new nations. So you've like gained control of blue and you had uh, black and yellow. You can now move your, mark, your black marker to blue. But when you do that, you'll have to move somebody else's control. So you're like swapping control with other nations or other players, secret societies in the game. Uh, and that is the coup action. Uh, if you're applying for a minor nation, like I said, you'll just choose either one of your nations to gain control of that area, which is either gonna give you control of one of these special abilities. Um, it's gonna give you uh, additional resources. You're gonna gain power whenever you gain control of nations. So your, each of your nations have a certain number of power. They, they'll increase on this board here. And at a certain point in time, if it goes over 20, you can use these markers here and flip them over to be the plus uh, 20 side. Yeah, the plus 20 on these guys here. Uh, the next action on your, uh, your secret society board is repolarize. This is not a used action um, for the most part, at least that I use, but it is important because you're gonna start with objective cards. There are three types, ascension, continuation, and the pole shift, which is the doom. Three ways in which Atlantis will end and it could be that it gets uh, destroyed, it could be that uh, it ascends, or it could be that it just continues. So there's like three unique endings. And based on the ending of the game, you'll be scoring points for these cards here. When you gather certain cards, you can gain Vera. It's gonna cost you to utilize this action. And, you're, um, and you can look on the board here, six Vera for taking the moon. At the end of the game, you'll score based on having certain uh, certain cards uh, based on this location here, and of course the cards in your hand. You can always take your two, put them on the bottom and draw two new ones, take these two, um, switch them out with two new ones. Basically you're able to swap cards with this action for the end of the game. Then we have the major nation actions. They all have the same actions, but depending on what nations you control is which ones you can use, and what nation is going to take those actions. You're taking the action for that nation, and you might not be the only player who does this in the game, which is why pawn markers are important. If I collect Vera from Az Azitlan, uh, then basically no one else is going to be able to do that until I move my marker off of that space, even if they control the area, obviously. Collecting Vera is you're going to be getting a number of currency based on the power of the location. The power of the location is the little flying symbol marker. It's also a way, it's also any bonuses from any buildings that you might have on that location. 
constructing buildings, you'll be able to place a free building and there's bonus actions uh, for all of these actions pretty much where you can spend additional Vera to do that action either again. Uh, in this case, it'd be five more Vera to place another building, whether it be on the major nation or on any minor nation that that nation controls. And there's a wide variety of buildings. I'll discuss them in brief detail. There's a better video, like I said, for all this um, on the description though. Recruiting. This is how you're going to recruit units. You recruit units um, from the, in the major nations for their power and for each minor nation they control as well. And then you can also spend additional Vera to place additional units out. The next one is move in conflict. And move in conflict and recruiting is the same thing as intrigue and coup. There is a difference in how they work a little bit, but the, the, the idea remains the same. You place out your units with recruit and then you will move units from one location to an adjacent location and start conflict. Certain areas on the game board are gonna have little markers indicating a one or three, meaning if you go through a river or ravine or go through the sea, you're gonna lose units as you move across those areas. But additionally, you're gonna place those units from one space to another space. And if, they, if any of those spaces has uh, aggressive units, you're gonna start a conflict. And conflict is resolved the same way that the coup is resolved with a slight difference in how it works. With a coup, the end of it, after you gain control or give control, you'll lose all of the spies in that area. With move in conflict, when you move your units and then lose some, hopefully not, by moving from one space to another, then you're going to initiate battle. And battle is going to involve you removing the defender's units if you win, and maybe they lose a building as well, changing the polarization of this board over here and the control. Um, you cannot fight major nations with this, only minor nations, just as a memory tool there. Uh, and you can gain control in this way. So very similar to the coup action, the move and conflict. And you can also do multiple conflicts as long well as you're willing to pay for it at five Vera. The last thing is a global, global conflict. This is a big one that all players are involved in. Normally speaking, whenever it comes to move and conflict or coup, it's gonna only be the players who are specifically affected by that in the area that you're doing the thing. In this case here, it's that nation will choose another nation and you'll tally up everything, all their minor and major nations with their, with their troops on them. And you will also check this board out and uh, you're going to reveal. And it's like a big loss. Players can lose like half their units and they'll lose two, up to two buildings or two uh, locations like minor nations. Um, so it's basically like a big world war. It's the way you can have nations fight against each other. And so those are all the major actions in the game. If a major nation controls a minor nation, you can activate one of their abilities here. On one side, it is the side that just explains it via symbols. And on the other side, it will tell you what it does in English. Do a construct action for this major nation, placing one additional building for free in every area without units. Additional buildings otherwise cost three Vera each. So it's a way to have a stronger building option as opposed to the basic construct building. This is a very strong building option. And after everyone takes one of these actions, they'll move their marker. Well, if this purple wouldn't go, this purple would go here. But if, after they move their marker, they take their action, they will pass. Next player, next player, until all players have taken an action. At the end of a round, when all players have taken an action, the round tracker will move one to the right. Then the end marker will move one to the left. You'll notice the wave marker, whenever a building is destroyed in the game, this will move one to the left as well. So buildings being destroyed increases doom, whereas the end marker will be the continuation ending. These markers will continue to move across the game board round to round until one of three things happens. Either A, this tracker here reaches the doom tracker, which symbolizes the pole shift, which is the doom ending, or the marker reaches the regular end, which will trigger the continuation end. And the final thing is these buildings enter play, these little cities or these little temple of lights. If seven hit the board in any area, then that will trigger the ascension ending, which is the good ending. Maybe you don't want the good ending. It's not necessarily a thing you have to do. <laughs> it's based on the cards in your hand. But that will trigger, there's the three different ways to trigger the end of the game. When the game triggers the ending, there are three main ways to score in the game. The first way you'll score is you will check the two powers of the nations that you control. So if I control green and red, and my green power is 16, and my red power is 13, 
I will take the lesser of those two scores, which will give me 13 points. I'll ignore the green one, but you want to push both of them to the front in order to get the, lo the lowest, as high as you possibly can. Uh, then you will score for cards, your cards in your hand, uh, whether it be the Ascension or Continuation. These will give you points based on the number of players who have these cards and whether that ending was achieved. Finally, you'll take your little bonus board that you got at the beginning of the game and place it on the board here and increase your Vera by the number on the far right hand side of the board. One, two, three, four, five, six. And you'll give yourself Vera for the uh, give yourself victory points for the amount of Vera that you have. Each of the boxes will have either a one, two, three, four, or five Vera. Add all three of those up and whoever has the most is the winner. There's also like two or three tiebreakers to make sure that there's only one player who wins the game. And that's pretty much how you play the game Era of Atlantis. Like I said, if there's anything I'm missing, if you want to go into full detail for this thing, definitely suggest the video down below though, because there's a lot to cover in this game. Era of Atlantis is kind of a political military game in which you are not only trying to vie for control of the nation that you're currently controlling, uh, but you're also trying to politically influence different areas to either uh, improve your major nation by giving it new minor nations, or you're also vying for the ending of the game. Maybe you want you, maybe you want Atlantis and um, Lemuria to be the winners. So you control those two areas, while at the same time you also want Atlantis to fall to doom. In which case, not only are you trying to improve their position throughout the game, but eventually you're going to want that doom marker to move over to the round marker before the rounds end reaches it. And so you'll be going around doing a little bit more political, uh, a little bit more military conflict than political, because in military conflict, that is how buildings are destroyed. You can also, of course, use the world war, the conflict action, uh, the global conflict action, in order to secure more buildings are destroyed in the game. All the while increasing the power of the nations on this track here, moving them as far ahead as you possibly can, because at the end of the game, controlling those nations are what is going to determine your lowest score of the two and give you a chunk of points. In the other ways you'll be scoring points, there are a number of cards in your hand that will give you some points, as well as, of course, having Veer at the end of the game can score you up to, I don't know, six, seven, eight points, depending on what turn order you took. But the main way you'll score points is power and how you can make sure other players do not control those areas by manipulating the game board so that players only score the lowest amount of points possible. There's a number of buildings in the game, and each building does something different. The uh, brown one will increase your garrison for the uh, area for military conflict. Um, you have the purple one for political conflict. Green one is for ma making additional buildings, I believe. Um, they tell you on here, I'll, I'll even look to make sure. Uh, no, the green one will increase your power based on the Temple of Light, if whether that's there or not, or just simply by itself it'll give you one. The gray one is what's going to let you build additional buildings and cause conflict. Temple of Light is going to allow you to flip over the end tracker to slow things down a bit and also increase its power, uh, the power of the nation on there. And then you have the black one, which is going to uh, allow you to push the Doom Marker five different buildings or six different buildings that you can utilize in the game, but only the Temple of Light actually triggers the end game for the Ascension, whereas the black one, Temple of Darkness, will trigger for the Doom. Um, and those are pretty much all the main rules I think you need to understand in the game. Just trying to basically make this tug of war in three different positions, whether it be control, whether it be how the ending works, um, and also securing uh, victory points by maneuvering the different areas on the board in kind of this weird 4X style game. This is a unique game that I've not really seen before, this style of actions where not only you have your own actions and your own secret society, but you're not actually in control of the nations, actually. You're not the leader of the nation. You are kind of like the vizier in the background moving his hands up and down or <laughs> tapping his fingers going, yes, yes, maybe you should fight the Atlanteans. Perhaps we can gain some power from their minor nation state and increase our power threefold. And the king's like, that's a great idea. I'm glad I thought of that. And then they go out and do the thing. And so that's what you're kind of doing in this game as one of these specific factions. Utilizing your markers, you could either end up working with Atlantis for a while, and then maybe Atlantis isn't pushing ahead and somebody else is taking control of blue and making it go farther. And so you go ahead and steal blue from that player and now you have the more powerhouse in the game and it comes down to the wire when this 
threat, this looming threat of either doom, continuation, or ascension starts pulling as people are all pulling for and vying for their own objectives. And then you realize, oh no, doom is more likely to happen and I have a bunch of ascension cards. I'm gonna actually repolarize, take these guys out of, out of the mixture here and gain the ascension card and gain some bonuses along the way and then fill up the board again. And all of a sudden, then the game switches again and it changes. And so there's a lot of changing aspects to the game that constantly will be in effect as the game looms its ending. The fact that the board is ever changing and that there's unique extra bonus actions that are actually quite powerful and useful is really important. Noticing that some spaces will be blocked on the board up until somebody moves them and so you have to kind of realize when players are going to want to play certain actions and when you should gain those actions for the specific locations that you own because not only are you in conflict with some people but you're also at some instances working together. You might be best of friends one time and worst of rivals the next and vice versa. It really just depends on what you control and what your objective is in the game. The style of game uh, with theme uh, works really well. It feels like you are actually the vizier in the background hiding with the secret brotherhood attempting to control the different political areas of this board here. You're working with people to fight other people. It feels like you're sending spies out to either cause political mischief or military mischief and you're never the one to actually do any of it. It's all done by the nations as they cause their own ruin with you kind of being the devil or angel on their shoulder. And that is a really cool aspect to this game. In fact, it's super unique. I haven't actually seen a lot of games do this. And I might have seen one or two, but I can't really recall them. Um, not at least at this scale. This is definitely one of the heaviest games I've seen with kind of political and military intrigue that is unique to itself with some unique mechanics and the way that switching these things works. Uh, the only one small gripe I really have is the fact that you can't make somebody only control one nation. You always have to follow, abide by the fact that each player has to have two. I understand why it's done, but they should have to push themselves out, I think. And if they end up being stuck with just one nation, all their viziers are just in, you know, Atlantis, they have to find a way to get them out. But in this case, you can't do that. If you want Atlantis, but it would cause green to take control of, or purple to take control of blue, and they already have blue, you can't do that. And that is like, bothersome. I wish there was a way that that could not be a problem, but it is either way, I suppose. Overall, though, it's a fun game. The components are nice. A lot of these bits are uh, still, these are like the prototypes, so you actually get miniatures for each of the different, um, each of the different military units in the game. So this is, as you see, a prototype, and things are going to change. Check the Kickstarter campaign. It will explain all the different changes that the game will have. But as it stands, this is uh, a great, great prototype. It looks great. The artwork is great. The board makes sense. Uh, all the pieces, while there being a lot of stuff on this game board, you're kind of solidified to your little space, and then you influence the wider world, and I think that works great. Combat, combat is cool. Being able to choose your side in some cases, or being the aggressor or defender is great, and it feels, um, feels like you're rooting for that area that you're kind of politically in control of uh, until you're not, and then the winds change. Yes, I like Era of Atlantis. I also like that this game comes with a campaign mode that will let you actually play Galactic Era afterwards. Uh, there is a way in which you can play three players. There's unique different variations for each of the different players in the game. It's definitely a longer game. It's a big table presence and it's a bit of a setup. So be aware if you're looking for a light game, this is not gonna be in your wheelhouse. It's definitely a heavier set game. There's a lot of different actions and each of those actions requires a lot of different steps that you're going to need to think about before you just simply do. Either way though, overall, it's an exciting, fun control, area control, almost 5X type of a game, explore, exploit, exterminate, etc. And it works really, really well. Love the theme of this game, that's my favorite aspect. Love the cool Atlantean aspect of the game. Overall, hands down a great game, provided you do not mind the length of the game and the complexity of the game because there is quite a bit there. But yes, overall, highly recommended. Thank you guys for watching another Unfiltered Gamer board game review for the game Era of Atlantis by CJ Games. If you're interested in picking this up, there is a link down below in the description where you can go ahead and check the game out and decide if it's right for you. Um, go ahead and also, if you'd like, subscribe to the channel. Hit that subscribe button, bell notification button, see more videos. If you already watched one of our videos on this channel at one point or another, consider giving us a subscription so that you can see more of our videos. We put out all kinds of different board game reviews from games that kids can play all the way up to the big boys for 14 plus, 15 plus. This is gonna be 
I guess 14 year olds could play this game, but it's going to be pretty, pretty challenging for them. It's got a lot to it. And it's also like a two hour game compared to some of our 10 minute reviews. So yeah, big chunky one. Uh, watch our live streams every Sunday at 6.30 p.m. PST. And also, if you'd like, go ahead and check out our website, unfilteredgamer.com, blog posts, giveaway, Kickstarter, lists, and more. All right, guys, that's all I got for you this time. And as always, I look forward to manipulating with you in the age of Atlantis next time.